So on the artist side of this industry, there are very few people who go by a one word moniker, Garth, <laughs> Cher, Madonna. But on the industry side, there's only one chief and he's with me on the podcast here today. It's good to have you on, my friend. Welcome. Uh, thanks for having me. And no, it's not Eric Church. It is me. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> the other chief, the less famous exactly. one as far as our audience is concerned. Um, so... I want to talk about the core. I want to talk about this new entity that you've uh, launched and, and how successful it is and what you guys are up to. But I thought for the sake of people who maybe are just getting introduced to you, let's get into your origin story a little bit. So tell us a little bit about your backstory in the music industry. And um, you've amassed so much success, man. So congratulations on that. But I'll let you do a little humble bragging. So go ahead. Um, thank you. It's been crazy. It's been um it's been a wild ride. Like, you know, when you're in it and you live it, you just kind of don't always see it. And then you have moments like this where someone's like, so how'd you get here? And all of a sudden you're like, oh, damn. Okay. But um, look, I, you know, really early on, I was always a massive just fan of music. I love the production side of it. I was never wanted to be an artist. I loved the creative part of it. I'd go to concerts and wonder about the sound and the lights and how, you know, the backstage process and the trucks and the buses. And it was always about that part of it for me. So started um, right after I graduated in Vancouver, I went to recording school for two years. I finished that to become a producer engineer. That's, that's what I thought I was going to be. Um, my first ever, I was, I was literally telling somebody the other day, my first two acts I ever recorded was a 17-year-old Michael Bublé, and and we were doing, uh, well, he was doing Frank Sinatra covers. So I was recording his Frank Sinatra covers, and then Nickelback had just moved to Vancouver, and I worked uh, with them on some of their first demos, and then there's this, like, you never movie. heard of either of them, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> it's and a pretty good way to start. Not bad, right? Um, and there's this bubbling music scene in Vancouver that was just massive at the time. So I started doing like live sound for a bunch of local bands. They would ask me, I mixed for Nickelback and mixed for Michael Bublé at lounges and just started doing a bunch of live sound and the studio stuff. And then, you know, the live sound turned into, hey, let's go to Alberta and back. Let's go to Winnipeg and back. Let's go to you know, Toronto and back. And then through that, they're like, hey, do you want to be our tour manager? So it just kind of became a natural progression where I started doing more live sound and then more touring and then more tour managing and then worked for a couple bands that we opened up for Motley Crue and Kid Rock and really got my feet wet on like really what what a proper tour looked like. And then that was it. I, I was sold. I love the live sound. I love tour managing. And then um, Nickelback signed a record deal and our first tour was 14 weeks and turned into 14 months and we're off to the races and we started in one van and it was the four guys myself and a guitar tech who is still their guitar tech today um, and we built that thing up to I don't know 16 trucks and 14 buses and we toured around the world and I was with them for 12 years, you know, so that. How old were you at this time when this first started? When I first started with them, I would have been 22 is when I first started with them. So, I mean, really, you know, I'm pretty sure there's still bars I was going into that I wasn't old enough to actually be allowed to drink. But um, it was a blast. And it was like, you know, there's no school for this, right? There's no school to become a tour manager or a live sound engineer. You just kind of like, you just do it. and. Look, I made a lot of mistakes where I thought I was going to get fired. But, you know, I was with a band that they were growing too. You know, they were making mistakes along the way. And it was kind of the perfect scenario to be able to just grow together and learn as we went on how to do it. And it, it was the best 
experience. So did that. Um, you and know, then how did your background in engineering, production, touring, uh, foster you to get such a great head start on a lot of other people when you decided to transition into management? Because that was sort of the next thing that you decided to tackle, correct? Yeah, I think it. So in 2005, the guys were taking a year off. They're just like, we're done. We're going to take a year off. You can go do what you want to do. And I was like, okay, I want to go manage a band. So I went and found a band called Hinder from Oklahoma. And it helped when, when you could go see a band play that is in a club and early stages. And I was able to sit there and I could really imagine how to take that band from a club act to an arena act and everything that it would take to get there. So <clears throat> all those years of like being on the road and being tour manager and live sound and knowing, I mean, even things like, hey, your sound guy's not very good. You know what I mean? Like, like right. your live show didn't sound great because your sound guy didn't do a good job. And your so, background in engineering and production gave you the competence in that realm to know what you were talking about. Exactly. And, and even, you know, furthermore, help them. Right, be able to sit there and sound check and go to the sound engineer and be like, Hey, I think like the vocals are buried, but why don't we do this and do that? And then the vocals, and they're like, Oh, great, sure, we can do that. Like, just to me, just the overall knowledge uh, of, of every aspect of touring just helped me become a better manager because I, I could really understand what it would take and also like how hard it was going to take. For these bands to get there and the kind of work ethic that you had to have so yeah so i i it, it does it all did just come together and make sense when it when i left that and went to management it was kind of a very natural transition for me and what were some of the indicators in the early days with hinder that made you feel like they could go all the way that they could become an arena act like i would imagine it was a combination of raw talent work ethic but what other components I mean, you know, that was still back, I mean, 2005, like, there were still living, breathing rock stars, you know what I mean? And, and Austin had this Steven Tyler meets Axl Rose kind of vibe to him, and he was a guy that would walk into a room, and he would own the room, and he was tall and, and lanky and had swagger, and everybody in the room wanted to know who he was, and then the rest of the band carried themselves just as equals. You know, they would walk into a room and everyone's like, holy crap, like a bunch of rock stars just walked into the room. So there's just that, you know, they, they always used to call it, maybe they still say, but, you know, that it factor. You know, what right. what is it about that artist that you're like, can they sing? Yes. You know, can they perform? Yes. Uh, you know, are they are they a good person? Yes. Are they good in, in interviews and press and PR? Yes. But there's something else that, the these true rock stars or or mega stars have and it's always that it factor where you don't really know what it is but you just know it's different from everybody else it it's not even it's not even something you can learn you just kind of have it or you don't yeah it's a uh, it's almost like this intangible it's difficult for us as the industry sometimes to see it because we analyze so much but the fans certainly know what it is and when you bear witness to that connection between the band and the fans, you can pick up on it really quickly and go, oh, yeah, these guys have the X factor. So with Hinder specifically, did they have Lips of an Angel recorded prior to getting a deal or did that come after? Because that was that was really the song that launched them into the stratosphere. I yeah, think. they did not have that song. And it's a funny story about that song is is they they got signed off a song called Get Stoned. That's what they got signed off. And when we went in the studio, um, we recorded 12 songs for that first record. And our A&R guy flew in from New York and he sat there with a the pen and paper and he gave every song a letter grade. And then, you know, like what would be radio singles and what would be, you know, album cuts or what. And, and Lips of an Angel was the least, the, the worst grade on the paper was Lips of an Angel. We all loved it. So we were like kind of shocked, you know, and he was like, I don't think so, guys. It's like it's like a, a rehashed 80s rock record, blah, blah, blah. And he just didn't like it. But we we fought for it to at least be on the album. And then when the album came out 
and we went with Get Stoned, and it, it did great. But every radio station started calling the record label saying, hey, we'll support Get Stoned, but Lips of an Angel is the clear smash off this record. And he was shocked. But, you know, that's the beauty about this business. You never really know. Sometimes, you, you, you know, you have a pretty good instinct and a pretty good gut feeling of what's going to work and what's not. But every now and again, you get these out of left field where you just didn't see it coming. And that was one where they just didn't see it coming. Yeah, it's one of the blessings of the modern era in terms of um, uh, key indicators from the marketplace. You know, you release a record and one of the songs will just stream like mad that isn't a single. And it's like, okay, well, that's interesting. And then in your experience going out and watching artists and bands perform live and seeing how well songs connect live. And that's not always an indicator, by the way, that they're going to do well on radio, but it does give you a pretty good idea when the fans are singing along with a song that they've never heard before by the second chorus, like, oh, I think we got a hit on our hands. And um, it's one of the reasons why I think our industry has become a bit more artist friendly because artists now have the ability to circumvent some of the gatekeepers, get to the marketplace and find out and get real time feedback on what the people who are buying, downloading, streaming and buying concert tickets are actually interested in hearing. Yeah, it's interesting. We've we've had this this topic is you know it's the hot topic, especially honestly during this this past year the pandemic because streaming became bigger than ever. But you know the social platforms, especially TikTok, became bigger than ever. Um, so to your point, the good news is it, it's taken away some of the gatekeepers and it's really allowed artists to make it artist friendly. The downfall of this is you don't have labels in particular you used to have people that would put their you know jobs on the line like i believe in this project i believe in this artist i'm going all the way i'm going to make sure radio plays it radio supports it everybody at the label i'm getting them on board and i swear on my life i'm going to do everything i can i don't care if, care if it takes 10 years i'm going to break this band they would fight the good fight right and some yes. of the biggest artists in history became those artists because they had those people on their team going, this will not fail. The problem now is we don't have that, right? Because- Yeah, if you think about Reba with MCA in the 80s, I think she was 21 singles in before she had a top 10. You know, and Vince Gill was a, a similar story. It's like, we don't have that now. Like now, if you don't hit it out of the park on single number one or two, you're done. It, you're done. And nobody is for, for for good reason, nobody's willing to put their career on the line because they don't have to, right? Because now you can you can go to your, your counterparts and go, the analytics now tell me this song should work. And if it doesn't work, no one's mad at you because you're like, well, the analytics told us it should have worked. So you're not gonna lose your job. You just go find the next one with the right analytics. So I get it. Nobody wants to, you know, put their put their their job on the line over an artist that may or may not make it. But it kind of sucks at the same time because you don't have true artist development, which we used to have, and that's how you used to get career artists. So, you know, my fear is like, are we going to start losing true career artists? Because the second the analytics say you're no longer relevant or it's not working are you done and somebody else comes in and takes that spot? It's the danger of the corporatization of the music business, right? When we start paying too much attention to numbers and not enough to gut feel. And I always try and keep this in mind with myself because you do want to pay attention to analytics. There's uh, there's a lot of value to paying attention to them, but we all followed our heart into this business, not our head. And we we sometimes can develop even better ears for what we know could be hit songs just by virtue of, of osmosis, of being in the industry. But there's less people willing to lead that charge now to your point and be on the, the frontier of breaking an artist because everybody's afraid they're gonna lose their job if they don't have a great quarter, right? Like that's yeah. part of it too. And the other thing that I think is really interesting is at radio, at least there used to be these these trailblazers who would yeah. roll the dice on certain artists, state their reputation like you just talked about, 
and they would fight for these artists and become somewhat or take somewhat some ownership in the success of those artists as they grow, right? And now you have less and less of that. We've sort of ceded the breakthrough territory to the streaming services by demanding so much data to take to radio. And radio has demanded this too, for the most part. So their complaint is sort of like, well, we don't get the songs first, so we can't be on the forefront and trailblazers. But in the same breath, they will also come back to you and say, well, before we consider adding this, we need to know what the streams look like. And it's, it's yeah, not a great place to be for the industry. No, it's exactly what you said. And it's funny you brought that because it was like, you know, five, six years ago, you go to radio and go, please play my new artist. And they're like, why should we play him? And you give them all, all, all the, this, these analytics and they'd be like, hey, we don't work off of that, right? We work up, do we love the team? Do we love the artist? Do we love the music? You know, are they touring? We want to see them live. We want to know that they're good live. Blah, blah, blah. And you're like, okay. And to your point, and now you fast forward like to now, they're like, hey, can you play my new artist? And they're like, well, send the analytics, you know? And if the if the analytics aren't what they want to see, they now won't play them, you know? And you can be like, yeah, but they're on tour and, you know, they're great live and they have a fan base and they're like, mm, I don't know, how are they streaming, you know? So the, it's, it, it's gone full circle and you're right. It's almost this really weird spot to be in for everybody, even even the A-list artists, because they're expected to stream naturally amazing. So if all of a sudden they release a project that doesn't, everyone looks at the numbers and go, uh-oh. Like, Huge oh, failure. Like, you fail, yeah. what do you do, right? So it's, it, it's, it's a weird time, it is a weird time. Hopefully it's cyclical like so many other train trends in this business and in business in general, right? Um, one thing I always admired about you, full disclosure, we worked together on the first arena tour that you did in Canada with Florida Georgia Line. Uh, that was a, a chief package. There was Dallas Smith on the front end, or sorry, Chris Lane on the front end, Dallas Smith in the middle, Florida Georgia Line. I remember uh, dealing with Kevin Neal at William Morris at the time on booking that tour. And one of the things I really admired about your strategy was that even though you had the hottest band on the planet in Florida Georgia Line, uh, a band that had just had a song that I think has now gone 11 times platinum in the U.S. with Cruise. You were really cognizant, more so than any other management team I had encountered up to that time as a promoter, about the ticket price and keeping that ticket price down so that we could celebrate rapid sellouts in these arenas. And you also weren't afraid to take that band to some of the smaller towns on that yeah. first run. Rather than playing Vancouver, we played Abbotsford. Rather than playing um, Kelowna, we played Penticton. Right. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about your overarching strategy when it comes to building the hard ticket for artists and how important it is to be sensitive to uh, the financials and, and really pay attention to that so that you can be a bit more long term, uh, enact more long term strategy as you're looking to build that artist and make the money down the road as opposed to immediately. Yeah, I think it, it and it comes back to, to the Nickelback days you know being able to see a band go from you know a, a van and a club band to legit stadiums all over the world and it was that mentality was every decision we made was for the long term you know and and brian and tyler bought into that quickly we told them two things every dollar you make starting needs to go back into your business right whether that's your live show what you know production, um, hiring more staff, you know, hiring better band, whatever it is to always keep elevating your business, it's your business. So if you're in it for a year or two, then you're just going to pocket all your money, you're going to quit and you're, you, you know, that was never our philosophy. So for us, when it came to ticket prices, when it came to production, when it came to where we're going to play and all that, to me, that'll never change, you know, and whether that was Nickelback in the 90s or FGL in 2000, it's like, and even now with our acts, we preach the same thing. This is about getting you to be a career artist and you're not going to be a career artist overnight. But if you believe in yourself, as we believe in you, then every dollar should get reinvested into yourself because what better investment in the world can you make than yourself if you truly believe 
this is what you want to do. So how much resistance did you get with that strategy? Because I, I can see artists going, wait a minute, I've been at this for a while. I've been chasing this dream for a long time. Now Ooh, the money's right. rolling in. You're right. It's hard when like a $50,000 check comes in and you look at the artist and go, okay, you should probably spend 25000 on new gear. And they're like, well, I was going to go buy a new car. And we're like, that's not going to help your, you know what I mean? That's not going to help your career. So you're right. You really got to get them into like, you know, we always say like in investments, right? There's short money and there's long money, right? You can, you can get quick short money every day. And then what? You know, but it's the long money is where like you really make a lot of money and you can have a lot of money over over a long career. So you just have to like it really comes down to like educating the artist. And that's where I think I think a lot of managers or label or agents or whoever, I think that's where they have fallen short and we have all fallen short in the past, is not really educating our artists. Cause as you know, it's so much more than just making music right? It is a business that is now multifaceted. It touches everything. And you do have streaming, you have digital, you have TV, you have film, you have sports, like it all touches everything. And then if you become a brand yourself, now you get into investments and branding and sponsorships and opening up new businesses and joint ventures and what you want. So you just can't get an artist and be like, music, go on two or 300 days a year, and that's all you need to do. It's just, you can't do that anymore. So um, we really try to like look at all aspects. And and part of, part of that is like making the right decisions for the long term and don't make those short term decisions. You know, I know artists that are like, you know, I got a sold out tour and I'm going to go in, in one bus and take no production so I can make a whole bunch of money. I'm like, great. Everyone's going to be bored as hell out of your show and they're not going to want to see you like for three years, right? Or go and take all your money, put on a ridiculous live show, and now they all want to come see you again and they want to, you can charge more and keep putting on a great show and keep showing them that every time they show up, they're going to get a great product. So, it's, so it's if you're an artist who has your first arena tour, where's the best place you can invest your money for the most ROI in your estimation? production, support, like where would you suggest you look at investing the money? And I know it's gonna differ artist by artist, but I would imagine there's sort of like, at this point, almost a template that you follow. Yeah, I think it's, so the most important thing is like, because if it's if you're headlining, it's because you have a fan base, right? So I would say number one is production, right? Make sure that like, just put on a good show. And you know, you don't have to go like, crazy like some people we were nickelback was big into pyro and then fgl was big into pyro because i told them how great it was for nickelback and you know so so you can pick and choose but you know a good obviously it's, it should sound amazing good lighting have a video you know what i mean like give give the things that people have come accustomed to so at the very least it shouldn't be less than what they expect it should be the minimum of what they expect. And then it should be hopefully more based on budget and what you're comfortable with. Then at that point, to, to what you just said, don't be, don't be shy about spending the money on support. Even if you've sold the show out already, it's about the experience, right? You want people to come and go, the minute I walked in the door and the minute I left, what a goddamn great show that was and had the best experience and you want to tell everybody and then you want to go home and stream everyone's music and then you want to come back when the, it's just people don't realize how effective a good show can be it's not just like oh one night i saw a show great i'm done people i mean you remember i you'd go i'd go see motley crew back in the day you talk about that show for months it wasn't yes. a, a one-time thing so um I don't think yeah, they had Alice cool. Cooper out on one of their more recent runs, you know, like yeah. as support at the time. And it was like, you know, Alice isn't cheap. You know, they, they spent some money and reinvested some money to make that all come together and work. And, you know, you were the same way when it came to the Canadian tour. It was like FGL. OK, great. They're hot. Who support? Well, Chris Lane, who was coming up and, and developing some real heat at the time. And Dallas Smith, who was a household name by that point in Canada, it was like, you know, you followed that. You didn't just preach it. You actually walked the walk, which was nice yeah. to see. 
Yeah. And so and with it, FGL, it, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, and it was, I give credit for Dallas too, because Dallas could have easily said, I'm a headline act in Canada. I don't, why should I go on before FGL? But he, he saw the big picture. He's like, they're bigger. I'm going to play in front of more people. This just makes sense. And he gets more conversion from it. Yeah. 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 Well, good on him for, um, for being able to control his own ego and see the opportunity in it rather than, you know, cut off his nose despite his face. Back to FGL a little bit in the building phase, because I think this is going to be really valuable for people to understand, especially artists who tune into this podcast. They were passed on, correct me if I'm wrong, by almost every label in Nashville at the time, correct? Yeah, it was like th this is, and you're right, this is a good, uh, is a good lesson for, for a lot of artists. Usually, not always, but if you get passed on, you know, you really want to know what the reason is, right? And sometimes the reason is you're not ready. Sometimes the songs aren't there, or maybe you're just not meant to be an artist. I don't know. Like everybody's got a different journey, different path. The interesting thing with FGL is we knew we had the songs. And the reason we knew we had the songs is because everybody we sent the music to loved the music. But it was very progressive at the time for country. And their live show was progressive, you know, and it was even without a big budget, their show was very rock and it was very high energy. So everybody in Nashville passed. Nobody wanted to take that chance. And it was inter interesting enough coming around full circle. The guy that signed Hinder out of New York is the guy that signed Florida George Line. It was Universal Republic. And they called me and the song was selling like crazy on iTunes. Streaming wasn't wasn't available yet. So And you released it independently, correct? You released it independently, yeah. And it was crazy because and literally for no reason, but we would all of a sudden one week we did a thousand sales of cruise. And then the next week we did two. And then the next week we did five thousand. Then the next week we did ten thousand. Then the next week we did twenty. So all of a sudden we're sitting here going Okay, we know we've got something. It's proven. It's selling, and people are reacting with no radio. And that's when Republic called and said, "You know, we're watching this song grow. We want to do a record deal." And we said, "We don't have a, a Nashville partner, so we really need a Nashville partner. We need someone to take us to radio." And they said, "Well, our Nashville partner is Big Machine because they work our country acts, and we work." Or, sorry, they work our pop acts, we work their country acts. And they were working Taylor Swift. So they're like, if we sign a country act, they have to work it. Um, and we're like, okay, but they already passed, like multiple times. And they say, it didn't matter, that was part of their deal. And look, at this point, we didn't really have any other offers, you know? So, and so when you released it independently, did you set up a joint venture label with the band or, or how did you go about that process? We did. We just did it as, as a joint venture between Big Loud and FGL at the time. And um, so we signed the record deal. Obviously, they took the music and then they sent it to Big Machine. And obviously, you know, Big Machine started working it. But it was at that point, it was a rocket ship. You know what I mean? It was off to the races. It was selling. We were selling out. Our club shows were selling out. I mean, it, it was it was an easy it was an easy one to take over. And then fast forward a couple of years later, Big Machine just then bought the rights back from Universal Republic and we ended up being back on Big Machine 100%. So during that process, there must have been a temptation and discussions with you and your partners and the band to just stay independent, you know, but, but you must have also realized that having a major involved in having Big Machine, especially the hottest label in Nashville involved, would put enough gas on the fire to really accelerate this project. How did you weigh that out? I mean, it became it became easy because we really needed, it, it, it's like we had done everything we could on our own, but we, we needed radio. And you need a great radio team, which is a lot of people, and it's very expensive to go to radio. Then you need relationships. Radio still runs on relationships. And... And the majors still control that. You know, they really do. You can be an independent, and sure, if you have a big enough song, 
you know, radio might play it, but you know, radio wants to know that they're playing career artists, right? Radio really doesn't. And if you really pay attention to radio, they don't play one hit wonders. They want to play an artist that they know is going to be a career artist because they want to support you and have you on, on their station for a lot of years. So they want to know that you got a good team, that you got a label that's going to put money into you. You got management that is going to make the right moves. You've got a booking agent that's going to keep you on the road and keep you working and then they'll support you. So that's where it still becomes a little hard for indies to get that real, that real ultimate Uber success with, with big radio stations, because it's really hard for radio to support indie bands where you could be gone next month and they never hear you again. And really it was uh, John Marks to some degree in satellite radio that really gave FGL the start, correct? That's where they were first appearing on radio. Yeah, it was John Mark. So before like DSPs kind of really and social media really hit, Sirius XM was like, it was the place where you could discover new music. That is where John story. Mark, yeah. And John Marks would like, he's, he's a guy that would play a song and leave it there. You know what I mean? He wouldn't take it off after one week. He would leave it there. And then he'd call you and go, look, I think something's starting to happen, right? I'm starting to get more requests. I'm starting to get this. Or after four weeks, he's like, hey, this song ain't happening. You know what I mean? But but he would give it a real shot. And then you, you would either build a story or you wouldn't. And if you didn't, you would then have to go back and be like, okay, hey, John, that didn't work. But what about this? We have another plan. And, and he would want to stick with artists because he's like, if you're in it, I'm in it. You know what I mean? And he wanted to break new artists. And that goes back to our early point of he was a guy willing to, to put it out there. He was a guy to be like, I believe in this artist. I'm going to play it. I'm going to support it because I really think there's something there. He's one of the last people to really do that. Yeah, he's uh, he's also been huge for introducing and substantiating Canadian artists in the American yeah. marketplace, right? So he's been a really great ally to the Canadian country music industry, particularly in, in helping get American ears and eyeballs on our product up here. It's just, uh, it's so important to have those those trailblazers still in this industry. And, and obviously, I mean, you've given him props and he deserves them, but we need more people like that as we continue to become more reliant on digitalization and analytics. It's like, we still need some people out there fighting the good fight for something that just feels right in their gut. Yeah, no, you're, and, and I think I think we're going to get there. Um, yeah, I, we are living in, in this little like, uh, you know, always a transformation bubble where everything is moving so fast and so quick. And, you know, nobody's ever seen TikTok stars before. And they've never seen stars break on Snapchat. And they're starting to see. But I think we're also through that. We're also learning that just because you have a TikTok moment doesn't mean you're a career artist, you know? And it's like, I think we're, we're going to see some of those are going to break through. And they will be great artists. But you're going to see most of them not make it and that's where i think you're going to see the transformation of like look we still have to develop these these, these artists that they have a TikTok moment and don't even know why and all of a sudden you're expecting them to like be prepared to go on tour and like go see the world and and they have no idea what's going on and for some of these artists it, it's a fluke you know what i mean they're just doing it for fun they're like oh, i didn't even intend to be to, to, to be a musician i just posted it for fun and got a viral moment and, and i'm not knocking them and not knocking anybody who gets signed off for that because i mean those are those, are those kind of miracle kind of stories right but again as an industry we have to prepare these people and you just can't throw them out there and if it doesn't work drop them and do it again drop them do it again that's just not that's not sustainable i really don't think it's not sustainable for touring, you know, because all of a sudden we have no touring artists left. And we all know people want to go see live shows. So I think it's not sustainable. I think it's going to change. I think we'll live in it this moment for a little bit. And then you'll start seeing like, okay, we really got to develop the, these artists. It reminds me a little bit of the stand-up comic scene in the 1990s. So you'd have people who 
you know, would go up, do a set, get discovered, get a sitcom. You know, that was the big thing the networks were doing. They were dropping these multi-million dollar development deals on these comics. And for every Jerry Seinfeld out there, there was a thousand people who got a development deal and never went anywhere. And it feels like we are putting a little bit too much emphasis, you're right, right now on on viral. You know, someone goes yeah. viral on TikTok and now they're getting offered a record deal. And it's like, there's still a whole development piece that needs to be done. And maybe that's a good parlay into the next part of this conversation, which is what you guys are doing at core. And, and so tell us a little bit about the spirit of that organization and, and how you and Simon came up with this concept and, and exactly what you guys do. Yeah, no, that it, and, and it is exactly why we're doing it. it is for all the reasons we touched on. But Simon and I got, um, we got connected by our lawyer. We have the same lawyer here in LA. We got connected about two years ago and I was at a different company. He was at a different company, but we just like, just the same values of like how to treat people, how to do business, you know, being upfront and honest and respectful and, and just doing, do making the right decisions for the right reasons, you know? And we just kind of connected on, on that personal level first. And then um, I was, you know, we were partnered over here at Live Nation and I was bringing Simon in to do his own thing at Live Nation. And we went and sat with Michael Rapino. And he was like, I love what you guys are doing. You guys should just work together. You guys should start a new company and just do it together. And we'd planned on doing something together. We just didn't know how that would look. And then, you know, the pandemic hit and we we're like, okay, do we sit around and do nothing or do we figure this out? And we just we just dove into it. And and it felt like it was a weird time to to start a new company, but it kind of just naturally happened. Like we went to Nashville and our first trip, we signed two artists and two publishing deals. And we just, every day we were working the phones and we were talking to artists and managers and publishers and labels. And, you know, everyone's like, hey, we're just, we want to know what's going on. So we're just going to sit around and see what happens. And, but there was a few people that wanted to keep working and we just kept like, we just kept grinding it out. And, and it turned it turned out being really a great thing. We have nine artists now, a couple of producers. We've got some TV and film projects going on. We've got some investment stuff. We're working with some sports players. And it was... And you, you guys know, are also fostering and developing some managers, correct? Yes, exactly. And it, it was the core of our company is why we came up with the name. But it's really, it, it's, it's, it's family. You know what I mean? We want to create an atmosphere where everybody feels safe they're protected if you need help we're here to get help if we're not the experts we'll get the experts and really doing things the right way and that comes back to like developing these artists like great you're you know we we signed a tiktok star we signed tiktok star nate smith you know 14 months ago and all we've done is just develop this guy we're like we put out music and we've done content and we've worked on his live show and we've just developed him and we've taught him about the music business we've taught him about investments taught him about what to do with your money you know and just setting the these artists up for success you know and and that's that is what our management company wants to do we don't want to work with people who we don't like we don't want to work with artists who don't appreciate us we want to work we want to come to work every day and kill it for all of our artists because they deserve it, you know, and they're willing to put in the work. And you know, Simon always says, you're not gonna find a management company that works harder than us, but if we're outworking our artists, that's a problem, you know? So if you want this, at least show us that you can keep up and work as hard as us. And it's been great, honestly, it's, we, we, we love our roster. We're having a lot of early success with them and they've all bought into the, we, they've all bought into it, which is like, don't worry that your next door neighbor is a TikTok star and has a record deal. Just don't worry about yourself. Like we always say, everybody has a different path, a different journey. Some people are more more prepared. Some people are more ready. Don't worry about it. Don't just keep doing what you're doing. Your time will come. I don't care if it takes ten years. We're not going anywhere. We're not going to give up. If you don't give up, it's going to happen. Um, so it's been, it's been great. And we've had a lot of like 
early like wins because of it. Awesome to hear. And it sounds like you've taken a real holistic approach too, which I really admire. Uh, you talk a lot about values. So what are some of the values that you and Simon really adhere to yourselves and demand from the people that you work with? I mean, you know, you, you, you it sounds cliche, but obviously, you know, trust is the big one. You know, if, if there's if there's a problem or someone's got an issue, whether it be with us or internally or a band member or somebody on the staff, you don't want to hear it from somebody else. You know what I mean? It's like if our relationship is not good enough that you can't just pick up the phone and be like, hey, I'm pissed about this or this happened or why is this artist getting this and why am I not? You know what I mean? It's like, so it's like trust and communication, right? We, we can we can figure out anything. It's the music business, right? We're not saving lives. There isn't no problem we can't figure out if you're willing to communicate and you're willing to trust. That's, a, that's first and foremost, all the time. We have weekly check-ins. We're always on group chats. If someone's having a bad day, we're like, great, what's up? And also like, like real communication, not just like business, but like, hey, I've got like mental anxiety over this. And it's like, okay, do we need to like get you help, like professional help, not just like, hey, blow it off, suck it up, go and do it. It's just not that world we live in. And, and you know, when you look at how many artists have have left this planet way too early, you know, and you wonder how many of them might still be here had we as just a business not recognized you know these these situations or these problems earlier or even understood what to do with them because even if somebody in the day said they they were mentally fatigued we're like what does that mean right we're like you're being lazy right don't be so lazy or you know you're living your dream you're bitching about being on the road i thought this is what you wanted right like that was always like the go-to instead of now where it's like okay let's really like dive into this what's really the problem and and is there actually you know some issues that we need to get professional help so i think that's a big part of it is especially with these you know we have some 20 year old artists you know and their parents don't know this business they're like they're looking at us going you got to help her like we're trusting that if if our son or daughter is coming to you with their career but we're also trusting that you're going to look out for their best interest as human beings. And you you look at examples, you look at, you know, what Scooter Braun did with Justin Bieber years ago when he had 18 days left of a world tour and he's like, I'm done. I can't do it. You know how many artists would have been like, okay, here's how much money you're going to lo lose. You know, you've only got 18 days left. You're going to piss off your fans. You're going to piss off the promoters. You know, blah, 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 blah. And Scooter was like, to his credit, was like, okay, great. Let's not do it. If, you, if you're if you not mentally fit and you're not ready and capable, let's not do it. Let's cancel the dates and go get you whatever help you need. And then you fast forward two and a half years later, the guy's bigger than ever, releasing the best music and appears to be in the best mental condition he's ever been in. You know what I mean? So... It's just stuff like that where you, you got to be able to like put aside success and money sometimes and look at like, you know, what, what's the best thing for the artist. It's our responsibility. And I think that's where it's starting to change. I hope that's where it's starting to change. Like whether it's a manager, an agent, a promoter, a record label, it's all of our responsibility to look out for these artists because we certainly want them around when we're like trying to run our businesses and we're all trying to make money and we can't make money without artists. So why wouldn't we want to look out for them and make sure they're just, they're healthy and they're fit and they're mentally capable of doing what's expected of them to do. So that's a big part of like the family kind of core culture we're creating here. And if you, if you assist them in those moments when they're suffering, you know, with mental health issues, it also helps build trust. They start to actually see that you've aligned your actions with your words in looking out for their best interests and making sure that they're okay first and foremost. And that's paramount. And that be, that comes before the commerce, right? And I think a lot of managers and agents and industry people are very adept at articulating that message. But 
when the chips are down, they're not always there. And well, on some level, the artist knows that. Yeah, and the one thing about this business, which is a guarantee, you're going to have downs. You're going to have lows. There's going to be a point where your career will end. That's just inevitable. So you're not, every song's not going to be a number one song. Every show's not going to sell out. There's going to be points where your career starts taking a dip. That is a guarantee to happen. If you can start preparing your artist now for the ups and downs, so so they're not riding this crazy roller coaster that just makes every day so difficult, and you can start really getting them to like ride the wave instead of ride the roller coaster, then all of a sudden you can have a healthy artist who doesn't get too high, they don't get too low, and they understand why things are happening. And again, that's on us to educate them. But then they that's how they they have a career and that's how they don't get burned out. Or to your point, they want to fire their team because they're like, my team ain't helping me. You know what I mean? Right. My team, my team loved me when I was number one, and now, you know, I'm not top of the charts, and now my you know, my manager won't take my call. That's just like that's just wrong. That's just wrong. Yeah, it's uh it's it's when you know it's time to quit. You know, yeah. if you don't feel like you can return the call of a client or if you feel like it's uh, too much maintenance for the ROI, then that's when it's time for the manager to have the integrity to go, listen, we got to go separate ways, you know. Yeah. And then it is it is fair to fall out of love with projects yeah. and, you know, people change over time. I mean, obviously with FGL, you started them, you brought them along, you had massive success. And then at some point, that situation ran its course so talk a little bit about that yeah it's i think exactly what you said is I mean, honestly like we get along amazing love those guys ended on nothing but great terms but you know you start and i don't blame him for this but you know you you have a level of success but you're always i think it's very common with any artist you're always wondering like what's next you know what i mean like great we've achieved all of this but how do we like but how come we're not garth brooks or how come we're not kenny chesney or how come you know and and there's nothing wrong with asking those questions and look we're, and what was your answer to that at times because it's it's not like they didn't have monster collaborations huge hits you know but you're right they never quite and maybe it's still to come but they never quite got to that like slam dunk stadium level yeah, and I, I you know, it, it's it's hard to give them to put your finger on it. Other than why not just keep doing what we're doing because it was it was growing and we're getting there, you know. But look, the fact of the matter is, at the end of the day, we are their only management that ever had. We were a brand new company that started from nothing and grew with them, and I'm sure in their minds, which is probably why they went with somebody like Irving Azoff. They're probably like, hey these guys have done an unreal job for the time we've been together and the experience that they have but are we as experienced as an Irving Azoff no so they're probably like I wonder if we go to somebody like Azoff who's got 30 more years experience and he's got the Eagles and you know what I mean like is he going to be able to bring something to the table that we just wouldn't be able to bring because of who he is what he's achieved and what he knows and you know what like to be determined you know what I mean I, I don't think we don't look back and go wow because they left they've achieved so much more um, and they still might have or maybe they've just gone ah, it's just different now you know but I get it I don't I don't again there's no ill will on our part for why they did that and you know, you're always wondering, you know, it's almost like uh, the Tom Brady thing, right? Why would you a team that you guys have had so much success with? And why would the team want you to go that you've had so much success? And sometimes it's just change. You know, people just be like, yeah, we're successful, but what it, what does the rest of the world look and feel like? And I think, I think that's, too, that's when cool. an artist rapidly accelerates, in the beginning as fast as that band did there's almost this expectation that develops where they want to keep pace with that exponential growth right and at some point you hit a certain plateau and there's still growth but it's not like it was in the first two years right and 
And if they've matched their mental blueprint to like keep pace with that expectation, then it's almost like they've, they've set themselves up for disappointment. You know, yeah, it's just, it's unsustainable. It is. And everybody, every artist compares each other to everybody. Right. So the first, you know, four or five years, I mean, FGL won every single new artist award and then every, you know, duo award. And, they, you know, and then all of a sudden, like, then you got Dan and Shay comes, right. And then brothers Osborne, and then all of a sudden they win a couple and all of a sudden they're looking at us like, why, why are we not winning all those awards that we were accustomed to winning? And why is Dan and Shay winning? It has nothing to do with, they're all friends and everyone wants to be successful. But to your point, those are the things that start like creeping in your mind. Like, is our team not doing everything they should be doing to keep us there? Cause that's the level we've come accustomed to. So I think you're right. Everybody wants that level and they expect to be at that level. And you know, it's, it's something, again, it's the highs and lows of the business. Yeah. It's, it's the difference between a honeymoon and a long-term marriage. Yes. Exactly. Right. It's like the honeymoon is great, but then at some point reality sets in, you know, and, um, there are times where it's just not quite as flashy as it was on the honeymoon. So yeah. yeah, fair enough. And thanks for being so open about that. So as it pertains to the core right now, where are you guys looking to develop your business? Are you actively seeking out projects? Are you more sort of developing what you have committed to at this point? Like where is your growth in the next six months to a year going to be focused? I mean, look, we're very excited. Um, you know, we're launching the Core Canada, um, which is going to be announced. Honestly, I think July seventh is when it becomes like public. But with that, we're we're announcing a partnership with Universal Music, and we're announcing uh, our first artist that we're going to launch through Universal. Um, we hired Tracy Martin from CCMA's to run Great that. Great hire, but, by the way. Yeah the best. I mean, her and I have talked about forever um, doing something together. So, so Canada is still a, a big focus. I mean, I saw firsthand how Chris Lane broke in Canada really before down in the U S I saw how Morgan Wallen was exploding in Canada before down here. Michael Hardy is the same thing. He's just becoming a rocket ship in Canada and now he's going to do the same thing here. So, and those are U.S. acts. Never mind the Canadian acts that that continued after. Even FGL was blowing up up here, exactly. and selling out bigger venues than they were in the U.S. So, so that's an interesting consistency among all these artists that you've worked with. What do you put your like? How do you determine whether or not something is going to be a massive success in Canada and then follow up eventually in the U.S. Or was it sort of an accident? Like, how did that happen? I mean, you must be asking those questions. Yeah, I just, I mean, I, I guess being Canadian, I never understood why, you know, America, for lack of a better term, they, they turn their back on Canada when we're like, we're right there, right? They, I mean, we, you second drive, largest country market in the world, right? Exactly. Yeah. You drive across the border and, and not even country, like, look at Bieber, right? Look at Drake, look at Buble, look at Nickelback, look at Celine, look at Shania, like, and some of the biggest artists ever. And it's just a line on a map. But yet, when you talk to Americans about Canada and touring and breaking artists, they, A, they don't even want to talk about it, or they just have no clue. So to me, it's like, it's such an open invitation to go and bring, and because your competition is so little, because so few American acts and managers are focusing on Canada. And when they say they have no clue, it's not like, it's not to be negative. It's really more like, why would they, right? If they if they don't know much about Canada, why would they think that Canada has a great country market? I know that because I grew up there. I know that because I've taken artists and seen it firsthand. But if you've never done it, why would you, why would you think of it? And when you look at like Lady A and you look at Dirks and you look at Keith Urban's, the greatest example of it who's doing arenas while he's still doing clubs down here in the early days so to me it's just like which is why we're launching the core canada there's such a missed opportunity for not only like all acts all genres but definitely countries like it's the fans up there are insane morgan wallen to this day will tell you 
the show he did two summers ago at Boots and Hearts was the best show to this date he's done in his life. Absolutely never seen, electric. Never seen anything like it. Went up there not knowing anything first time ever and 10,000 people screaming every word to every song and had no idea how that happened. So when you see and hear that, it's like, oh, we're gonna go up there and make some noise. We're gonna capitalize on it. And it's a great market to break artists. It just really is, especially country. What are some of the other global markets that you see a lot of growth and opportunity and potential in at this point? Well, look, Australia is a great market. Europe's a great market. But, you know, the problem is just getting there, right? It's so expensive to go over there and to tour. And then, like, I remember the early days in Nickelback, we would go over there 12, 14 weeks at a time. And people today would be like, why would you go over so long? And it was like, it was so expensive to get there. Your flights were so expensive. Shipping gear was so expensive. So once you got there, you had to play all these shows just to break even, just to like, like claw your money back. So as much as it's great to see these other markets start to break open for country, you know, there's only four or five cities in Australia. Right. So you can go play there and do five shows and you might break even um, in Europe. There's some festivals that you can go play in the summer and you might break even. So th this kind of comes back to like the full circle of like career artist. Right. Because if you become a Taylor Swift, then great. You can go and do 25 shows in Europe and go do 20 shows in Australia and go tour the world and make money. If you have like a one song, no one's paying you more than a thousand bucks to come over and do your show and you just can't do it for that. So there are other markets, but I still think Canada, obviously North America collectively is where our focus is definitely going to be on. We, um, you know, we're going to continue to develop artists. We're going to continue to bring on managers, co-managers. We're going to continue to focus on some TV and film stuff. Um, not just country, we're doing all genres, you know, and we're going to just continue to grow, but do it the right way. You know, we're, we're in no panic, you know, we're going to do it with artists we love. We signed an artist the other day and we said, nobody's going to hear from you for a year, just so you know, because you're, you've been singing for two months. So you're great. You got a natural ability, but we're, we got a year of work to do to get you ready. And they're more than excited to do that because they don't want to rush out on stage when they're not ready. They don't want to go on tour when they're not ready. They don't want to go do a showcase for a record company and blow it. They're like, no, 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 no. You guys get me as ready as possible. So when we go and do this, it's going to work. Man, I'm so excited for your future. I've got mad respect for everything you've accomplished. And uh, I just feel like you are going to continue to develop your own legacy as you, uh, substantiate the legacy of all the artists that you work with. So congratulations on everything you've done and thanks for taking the time today to do this. Dude, thanks for having me. Good seeing you.